Do you find it hard to explain to friends and family what you now do? Are you wasting valuable time by attempting to figure out challenges on your own? We have created a community for ex-corporate people running their own business who want to live a life they love whilst giving back to their community. This is the Build Live Give Show. We bring you first-hand experiences of guests going through many of the struggles you face each and every day. We get real with no corporate BS. And now your host, Paul Higgins. Welcome to the Build Live Give Show. I'm Paul Higgins and I'm your show host. And today I'm very excited to have Kath Walters from kathwalters.com.au. Kath started as a visual artist and then she went into journalism and she worked for one of the best publications, business publications and magazines in Australia. It's called the BRW, where the top richest people in Australia go into a list and she got to interview a lot of them and learn a lot of things from them. She shares those learnings in this podcast. She also then realized that the writing was on the wall, pardon the pun, for journalism and she thought, how do I pivot? And she's done a brilliant pivot and she talks about how she helps people write successful business books and uh, she gives amazing insight into that. She apologizes for her tone. She's saying that her grandfather gave her that, she inherited it, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful tone and I actually think that the amount of value that she delivers is, is brilliant. So it's really worth listening to this podcast. So uh, what I'll do now is hand you over to Kath Walters from kathwalters.com.au. If you're enjoying listening to these journeys, just letting you know we have a community for ex-career people running profitable businesses just like you. It's called BLG Boost. You get exclusive access to a forum of like-minded peers answering your most pressing questions 24-7. You get specific action tips to solve your most common challenges. You get trusted suppliers to remove lost time. You also get access to member exclusive offers to save you money. You also get access to myself as a coach directly on a one-on-one basis. You get weekly videos from global experts. And finally, you get monthly webinars solving topics mentioned in popular threads. If you're tired of being alone and want to rapidly grow your dream business, go to buildlivegive.com forward slash BLG boost. This link is in the show notes. Please check it out. Okay, I will see you inside. Welcome, Kath Walters from kathwalters.com.au to the Build Live Give Show. We're going to get to know a lot about you today, Kath, but why don't you start with a bit of your backstory? Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Um, I have spent the last probably uh, 15 years being a business journalist um, until about five years ago when I started uh, my own practice. Um, which we'll talk about shortly. So, yeah, I mean, I wasn't always a journalist. I I did start life as a visual artist. (laughs) Um, And then uh, about sort of 10 years into that, I I realised I sort of needed something that was uh, a bit more consistent. Uh, We had to apply for a lot of funding all the time in in arts. So I I really just started to to do a, a transition into into journalism and then I started working at Business Review Weekly which was a magazine um, that was part of Fairfax and uh, had an absolute ball there for uh, about 14 years. I did a year online when I left BRW and uh, that was also fantastic. It was an absolute sort of um, J curve, learning curve in into the world of online media and uh, that was terrific. It was after then that I, I launched my business. Fantastic. And uh, for some of our listeners out there, visual artists, just give me okay. an example of what a visual artist would do. I went to art school. Uh, I grew up in Canberra mainly. I wasn't born there, but I went to art school in Canberra and I studied printmaking. So I turned into a screen printer. So there's different sorts of printmaking. Yes. You can be uh, do you can do etching or um, lithography. I did screen printing and uh, for a number of years I, I uh, created screen printed posters so this was a long time before the internet so um, it was one way that we used to kind of communicate with uh, with an audience was via posters. Uh, excellent and was there any history of journalism in the family? There was not any history of journal. well actually that's not entirely true my my eldest sister um, was a fairly regular letter writer 
to the Canberra Times and she got a lot of letters in there. Um, so there was a little bit of that, but nobody had been a journalist. No, I was, I was the pioneer of the family there. <laughs> Brilliant. And what's something uh, that the BLG listeners wouldn't know about you from outside of, of work that your family or friends might, but uh, the BLG audience wouldn't? Look, when I was in my, uh, straight after art school, I went to live in Central Australia in the, in the desert, sort of um, about 400 kilometres southwest of Alice Springs at a place called uh, Docker River. And uh, there I learned to speak a little bit of Pigeon Jala. So I think most people wouldn't know that I speak a very minuscule bit of Pigeon Jala, <laughs> which is the language there. Excellent. How long did you, how long were you there for? I was there for two years. Uh, it was a fantastic and really transformational sort of time. Um, it was very tough, you know, uh, for people there. There was a lot of poverty, but there was also a great deal of fantastic culture and uh, incredible enterprise. The, I was working with a bunch of women in their art centre and they were very enterprising and uh, dynamic group. Excellent. And it was that was Aboriginal painting because, uh, you know, we've got a world audience, but just to sort of let people know about Aboriginal painting if they haven't heard about it and sure. I suppose the popularity, how popular was it back then when you, you worked yeah. in Alice or out of Alice, I should say? This was the, I was working exclusively with women. Mm -hmm. There was more of a tradition there. They were doing um, batik. So they were doing sort of Indigenous designs and painting from their, you know, local dreaming stories. The Honey Ant and the Seven Sisters were the dreaming stories down there. And they... Um, did those designs onto batik, which was a te technique they'd learned from a community nearby. And that was quite, quite innovative because in the past they'd really only done, um, they'd done carving, there was carving. There wasn't really a tradition of painting, even amongst the men. That has completely changed. So it was really early days in that, uh, you know, when I was there in the early 80s. There's a really dynamic, thriving culture um, of art, uh, painting, uh, carving, batik, everything up there now. And a lot of it is run by the women. And yeah, so it was thrilling to go back quite a long time afterwards, a couple of decades and a bit afterwards with my, with my daughter and to see so much, um, so much had come out of that period of time. There's so much enterprise and art going on. Oh, brilliant. And uh, if I go to your time at BRW, mm. just, you know, there's, um, I'm sure you've got so many brilliant stories you could tell, but what's one story you could share with the BR, or with the BLG audience <laughs> about the BRW uh, magazine and someone you might have interviewed or an article? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, look, I, I really was, it was such a fantastic role. I had a lot of fun. I interviewed people from um, you know, the Rich 200, Len Ainsworth and um, people in the, you know, Ed Bateman and very, very wealthy people, um, to people who just started uh, their companies. And in fact, the guys from Atlassian who have now become somewhat of global phenomena, yes. uh, I remember talking to them when they had barely worked out what they were doing. <laughs> they were on the Fast 100 list, um, Mike Cannon Brooks. Um, and I had a good chat with them about what they were doing. And, um, you know, that was such early days. So lovely, um, lovely to speak to. And uh, they were clearly going to go far. Many of the companies that were on our Fast 100 list, which was, you know, really about people who were starting up or had just been going for a few years in many cases, um, they went on to, to end up on the Rich 200 list. <laughs> Yeah, so well, we, we had a recent guest on uh, Kobe Jones who runs a private investment bank. So he deals with a lot of the, the well, wealthy families here in Australia. And I asked him, you know, what's some of the traits or the habits that he saw that uh, really um, stood out against, um, uh, you know, against the general population. And, and for you, you know, dealing with that top, 200 etc what were some of the traits or some of the the things you could share that were your learnings with spending time with people like that yeah look the people who i really noticed a very strong characteristic amongst people who were building businesses um even or building wealth but in particular those those fast 100 um entrepreneurs which was they were very single-minded about where they were going so they had a very sort of 
um, clear direction, but they were very open-minded about how they got there. And it was really a, this very noticeable kind of um, uh, almost a, a sort of a strange, you know, double thing. You know, they were they were they had this kind of absolute, almost myopic focus on where they were going, but how they got there, they would talk to anyone and anyone, everyone about, you know, so they were, um, it was really, really quite distinctive and noticeable. Yes. And, and did, um, and, you know, often I'll listen to podcasts and hear a, a similar thing. And could you, um, did you get an insight into their personal lives, whether that did come at an expense of their, their personal life when you were interviewing? I, I always found that the, the most successful, um, entrepreneurs were the ones who had the most sort of they were the most self-aware so they tended to be very very willing um, to uh, accept help to accept that they were not um, they were not good at everything and I think that sort of a level of I mean you could call it humility I suppose it was it was self-awareness really I think played out a lot in their personal lives I think that you know there is a massive sacrifice. Um, building a business, any business, always takes longer and you know is so much more expensive and takes much more time than anybody ever thinks. Um, but uh, they they did, and they generally had massive support. You know, um, including um, occasionally um, the women um, who went on that same journey. And I'm, I know you're going to ask me who, and I'm just thinking of her name. Yep. Who started? Uh, who started Carmen's Fine Foods? Um, ah, yes. Wonderful, wonderful woman. Ah, oh, dear, I shouldn't have forgotten. Um, yeah, That's right. um, Carolyn. Carolyn, yes. Carolyn, Carolyn forgive us, forgive yeah. us, Carolyn. <laughs> yes, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's a good friend of um, one of our family friends. Started uh, Furbank and still uh, oh, yes. Fernwood, I should say. Oh yeah, yeah. and still runs Fernwood, and. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, she's a good friend of Carolyn's. Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, and I spoke to her, Karen and Creswell. <laughs> Carolyn Creswell, it came back to it. me. Um, yes, so, and I spoke to Carolyn a number of times. And her, her um, husband was a stay-at-home dad. And uh, we talked a bit about the, the um, you know, remarkable amount of prejudice that, <laughs> that they encountered around that. But he was, you know, that was a conscious decision of, of theirs that she would focus on building the business and he would take a more of a, a role in the family and do you know all the things that would normally perhaps be done by the um by the wife mm -hmm. yeah well thank goodness i suppose that uh, that certainly changed i get the in, i get the inverse where my wife still works in corporate and mm -hmm. as you know I'm, I'm running this fantastic community but yeah people i can see uh and, and certainly some um, close family friends still don't understand it like, I think on. that's very true. Yeah, there's still a lack of understanding of it. It really is. Yeah, yeah. But uh, and what about for you? So there was 15 years at BRW. What sort of mm. led you to to then go go out on on your own? Oh, look, I felt like the last five years in um, in in media, I, I sort of felt like I was on borrowed time. Uh, I, we were writing all the time about the rise of the internet, and we knew it was impacting on media. Mm -hmm. um, we were very well aware. So I was sort of a bit like I was galloping along on a horse and, and the ground was sort of gradually sort of <laughs> disappearing underneath me. Um, I knew it was going to. And so eventually um, I left to start a practice. I just thought, well, um, you know, the masthead that I was working, this is an online masthead. They, they decided to close that. And rather than try to um, find, you know, a new role in media, I really thought, well, now's my chance to go back and do do something, I guess, with all that I've learned um, to, to create something for myself. Great. And, and what were some of those initial fears when you first stepped out into your own business? What were some of those fears that you encountered? I think, you know, um, fear of financial insecurity, really. Um, uh, you know, I really did loving, I love having a paycheck. Uh, mm -hmm. I found, you know, I had been a freelancer when I first started journalism. It's very uncertain. There's a kind of, a, you know, one, it's all feast and famine and all the rest of, you know, nothing that no, everybody knows this. But so that, that sort of getting, getting to let go of the ups and downs and, and to sort of try to address them the best I can, that was my biggest fear. And I suppose the other thing was that, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what I had to sell. 
<laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah. know what I could sell. Yeah, and and how have you got some help, or what's what's got you? And I know we'll talk more about your um, your business journey in a moment. Mm. But uh, what sort of help did you get to start to work out what you could sell, and and also how you could start to make it financially viable? Yeah, look. Um, I have had a lot, a lot of help, <laughs> and I do recognise. I, I mean, I do recommend really that people um, seek a lot of help. Um, uh, I, I first did some um, training in the idea of thought leadership with Yamini Naidu. Um, she's a, an international speaker now um, and a thought leader in business storytelling. Um, so, and then I joined the Thought Leader Business School, which is started by Matt Church. Um, Peter Cook and Christine, Christina Guidotti is now one of the um, uh, people, the partners. Yes. Um, then I, I also, I started immediately at um, the hub, the hub Melbourne. So I started in a co-working space uh, yes. where I met um, Carolyn Tate, who runs the Slow School of Business. Um, she now is doing something called the Purpose Project. So both those things are sort of going, but, you know, a really dynamic person, uh, very exciting. And um, I also learned a lot about um, uh, selling from Rachel Burke, who runs a, a company called Sales Space, I think. Yes, that's it. Yeah, I know, I know Rachel. Um, oh, you do. Shout out to Rachel, yes. She um, really did change, very much change my sales process so that it was something um, that went, well, I would have to say, if I was being 100% honest, Paul, I'd have to say I kind of hated it to a, a thing where I really loved it. And, you know, I, right. I, I now have this process, thanks to Rachel, that um, is just one that both I and my prospects really, really love. By the end of it, we just, it's easy to make a decision for both them and me. And, um, yeah, uh, it's great. And now I'm doing training with uh, Grace Lever, who's um, the um, very dynamic Australian woman who um, started a, company called or a project called the doing academy and has kind of gone global and ballistic um i'm doing her thing called the inner circle so it's sort of about uh, it's about automated marketing oh brilliant great yeah. well, we'll, we'll put um links to to those people so other people can or blg yeah. listeners can go and uh, find out more of that if i uh, now go to today. Can I just add one thing there, Paul? Yeah, sure. Go I, for it. I've had a coach all the way through this, just a, a personal coach, a, pers a person who's helped me with everything from, you know, business ideas to um, my health and my, you know, well-being. Um, Tess Bartlett, she's been absolutely amazing. So, yeah, she'd be a great person to link up to. Excellent. Great. So uh, I'll, I'll head have her and also the other names that you've mentioned. And right. uh, certainly we've we've got lots of clients in the BLG community that have come through Thought Leaders as well. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we've worked with Rachel before. So uh, small worlds. But, uh, yeah. yeah, look, I, I can certainly um, endorse them yeah. as well. So the next section is the build section. So mm. when you um, walk into a, a networking event or you someone says, hey, Kath, what, what do you do? How do you answer that question i would say in a networking event i'd say i help thought leaders to write brilliant business books <laughs> um if, if i'm just being asked by a taxi driver i'd say i help people to write books so it depends a little bit on how much they know but yeah so i help people write books that's that's what i do now great and uh when you said uh thought leaders so any particular mm -hmm. thought leader or any particular style that you help people with yeah, look, what are, what we're talking about are business books. Uh, so no, I don't help with memoirs or you know um, novels or that sort of thing. So this is people who have an area of expertise. Uh, they may call themselves business consultants. They may call themselves coaches or mentors. They may call themselves trainers. Um, you know, there's all those different names or thought leaders. Um, uh, they'll typically be working for themselves, similar to me. Um, uh, perhaps with one or two staff or something like that. And they will um, have an area of expertise that distinguishes them in the marketplace. So they'll be, they'll be sort of controversial thinkers in a certain way. Um, so I love working with people who, who think differently. And the, yeah, they're my, they're my um, ideal market because they've, they've got um, a lot to say on, on what it is that they're tackling. 
excellent. If you had to give some short advice for someone that's on the sitting on the fence, I think there's a what famous saying that everyone's got a book inside them, but not many actually release it <laughs> or, or, or push it to the world. So uh, for those people that are sitting on the fence at the moment, deciding whether they should or shouldn't write a business book, what's some advice mm. you'd give them for, for helping them make that decision? I think the important thing is that <clears throat> to give it a try because um, the reality is it's never been um, easier um, or more accessible might be the correct term to uh, write a book. So we can now write and self-publish a book um, in a way that's never been possible before. And yes. the reality is that if you don't write your book, um, you might find that someone else is in your market pretty soon writing the book that you should have written. Quite often I, I notice people who've been in a, you know, who've been getting word of mouth referrals for, for maybe, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, somebody will come into their market who's written a book, not necessarily um, as good as what they would write, and is, is, is sort of basically, isn't the word, eating their lunch or, you know, so they come in yes. and take their clients. So, um, yeah, I think it's really, really important. It's a fantastic way to educate your market, to qualify your leads, you know, so to make sure people that you are talking to actually want to work with you you can share your message with the world it, you know it's a it's a fantastic strategy um for sharing your message to a very large audience and how many people that uh, launch a business book also now have that uh, as an audio audio book as well yeah look that's a good question i am a super fan of audio books and i love um i love uh, especially, you know, all sorts of reading on audiobooks, including business books. Um, I would recommend it, but it's not something that I, I deal with the um, concept of page. Although, actually, we record the book. That's my process, is that interview recordings. Yes. So there's the option there for people to actually um, uh, break it down into podcasts at the very least. Um, reading a book, you'd need to commission somebody who is a really great reader to, to read it through unless you're very good at um at reading through without stumbling. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it's really difficult. I've, I've heard that you've got to talk like this, so you do short bursts of right. words and then stop, and it's got to be a hundred percent. It. Yeah, I've heard it's that's it's very hard. difficult. Yeah, mm, but it's a great idea. Brilliant. And um, about your business model, how you make revenue? So, how do you mm. currently make revenue with um, helping people release these fantastic books? Yeah. So I. I I make revenue from this mentoring program. It's a 90 day program. Um, and I, I have a cut of three different levels of it. I have a sort of a self guided where I give people, you know, an introduction. We develop all their, their book outlines and that sort of thing, their chapter contents, but they, they do the finished chapters themselves. They, they do three with me and they do the other six themselves. I have a, a sort of partially guided one where we do six of nine chapters and I have a fully guided one where we do um, all, the, all the work together. So yeah, I, I just have a system whereby I kind of, uh, through this asking of questions, I extract the ideas from people's uh, experience their their capacity to explain what they're doing so I get it out of their heads and onto the page that's that's my gig Brian and I know you've said before that you've got lots of help from different people but mm. what's uh, a key learning so far for you for for scaling your business ah oh, wow yeah look there's a lot um, I think in terms of Growing the business, I think it's definitely kind of get on the phone, basically. And because you can only really know the value of what you've got when you have the incredible privilege of working with customers and clients to, um, to try to achieve what you're offering. And, you know, they give you so much. So it's, it's a very much a mutual exchange. You really understand a lot, a lot more about yourself, your own value, um, what's important in your programs that you've developed by actually working with people. So it's get on the phone, you know, develop a program, get on the phone and try and sell it. And yeah, if you don't sell it, um, develop another program. <laughs> and, and what are some of the biggest challenges that you face at the moment in uh, growing your business? And I know that you've got a new exciting business that you're about to, to launch. So um, what are you 
maybe your current challenges or what do you see as some of the future challenges coming up with that business launch? Yeah, look, I, um, my, my challenge now really is, uh, as they say, the top of the sales funnel. Um, so I'm automating that to some degree. So my, my, some of my challenges around learning some automated marketing um, strategies through Grace Lever's training. And that's really just to, uh, to add people. So I'm, I'm developing um, some free online training that's called a Book Ready Boot Camp. And the idea there is that people um, can do that training and if they, they, they find it useful and valuable, they may want to go on and, and um, start to talk with me about their plans. So that, that's quite a new area for me. I've had to do a lot of learning. It's quite challenging learning these new things. Um, I also, uh, I, I've decided to form partnerships with various other businesses. And it's not a challenge, but it was. I mean, it's now starting to actually, um, it's starting to bear fruit. But what has, you know, it, it took a while for me to recognise that there were some parts of the process that I didn't love doing. And I wanted to really focus on the parts that I did love doing. Um, and I wanted to be able to offer the full package. So I've sort of formed relationships with other people in the marketplace who are fantastic in the parts of my process. So I have to be willing to give away some of my fee to offer the whole package. Um, and I think the other thing I have had to, the other big challenge really is learning that um, it's really important in this kind of program, in any sort of coaching mentoring program, I think, that you feel pretty aligned, you know, I, I need to feel aligned, my values are aligned with my clients. Yes. Um, and so uh, I have to say no to some work where I feel that it isn't going to, I'm not the best person for them. So if I feel that there's a little bit of a misalignment, and that's why I love my, my sales process, the discovery session that I offer, it is, um, a, you know, it's a free thing and it is a sales conversation. Um, I explain my programs and, and all that sort of stuff. But it's, it's very much based, it's sort of almost like a coaching um, session in itself. And what we find, what, what people find and I find is that we sort of know at the end whether it's going to work between us. We'll, we'll be very clear as to whether or not we're, on the same sort of page. And I think that really makes a huge difference. Yeah, look, I think that's a great point. And, and I think the real benefit of running your own business and not being in a career role is that you do get to choose who you work with. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sometimes a really hard lesson to learn to get to that. I think a lot of people still think, well, I'm still in a career and whoever comes in the door, I've still got to you know, basically work with. And I think that's a really rich point that the, the more niche you get, the more specific around your values, your behaviours. And we actually in, our, in the club have a, a ranking system where we'll basically rank everybody that comes in out of 100. They mm -hmm. get a score and, you know, 75 plus, that's fine. They go to, through to the next gate, so to speak. But 75 plus, anything less, we then give them other options that they, they might, might want to have. And every time we've done that and implemented that in, in one of our clients' businesses, it's certainly uh, made it. Uh, a lot more enjoyable and a lot more profitable to work with people that are really well aligned. So I think that's a, an excellent point. And for people that are just starting out their journey in the BLG audience, if you do that uh, quickly, uh, it can wreak uh, enormous benefits. Yeah, it's been, it's been a, a, a tricky learning. Um, uh, but yeah, look, I am grateful to every single client and, and always feel fantastic about my decision to work with people. Um, I also sometimes feel like really fantastic about my decision no longer to work with people or not to choose certain sorts of projects because I feel like it's, it's very much a mutual thing. If I'm not 100%, you know, on their page, if I can't say with absolute conviction because writing a book is fairly um, personal, uh, it's, it's almost an intimate journey, really. There are times in the process of writing um, a book where people will be very uncertain about themselves. They'll feel maybe I haven't got something to say. <laughs> uh, and I need to really, I need to believe 100% in them to be able to help them pass those points. Brilliant. Great. And, and uh, around um, 
you know, obviously, like you said, you had a great paycheck back in your BRW days, et cetera. How are you going with paying yourself from a commercial wage point of view in your, in your current business? You know, were you able to get there quickly? Uh, are you there paying yourself a commercial wage? Mm. Uh, what, yeah, just give the audience a little bit of background on that. I went up very high in the first year and came back somewhat because at first I was selling done, done for you, as they would say. So I was selling programs where I would write people's um, blogs and that sort of thing. So I was selling writing as a package and it was great. It was fantastic. And I learned a, a huge amount um, about running content marketing programs. So this was more in the blogging sort of when I was focused on blogging and content marketing. Yes. Um, and then I decided to focus more on training and mentoring and that sort of thing. And that has, that meant that I had to take a step back really. Um, and I now, so now I'd say I had a, a, my bookkeeper did send back my, <laughs> my profit and loss statement for the year. Um, I, I, I'm doing okay, but I, I need about another, I, I'd be happy if I had another sort of same again on it. So I, I'm aiming for a turnover of 240,000 in, in the current financial year. But of course, when you have a turnover of 240,000, you get that less tax and expenses. And I have to hire an assistant to help me and, and that sort of thing. So there's, there's expenses out of that. So that's turnover revenue. Yeah. yeah, look, and I think that's an important distinction that often people always talk top line numbers. Yeah. But uh, as you, as it's the, the banked dollars, um, which I think is is really important. And uh, and that's after taxes. I know a lot of <laughs> small businesses, uh, when they get the, the tax bill, go, mm, how am I going to pay for that? So, yeah, <laughs> look, uh, th that's great. And I think um, pivoting and getting a more sustainable, it sounds like a more sustainable um business model where it's not all relying upon you is is a really important pivot but that can be difficult and i think what i i've loved so far is that you've actually got some help doing that and i can see that you've got different experts helping you in different phases of your business which i think is a really smart which will no doubt uh, hold you in really good stead for the next growth phase that you're about to go into and uh, next question is around uh, support from a partner. And now uh, you talked about Audrey, your, your daughter. So if she was listening to this podcast, what would you like to say about her support of you building this business of yours? Yeah, so I'm, I'm single at the moment, um, but my daughter, Audrey, um, while she was still studying, was being my virtual assistant um, for some of that time. And she was really um, absolutely fantastic at it. So to her, I would say uh, you're the single most supportive, really amazing, organised, funny and wonderful assistant and daughter I could have ever wished for. And you've transformed my business and my world. Thank you. <laughs> uh, excellent great great the next section is the live section and i'd just like you to explain to the blg audience just a couple of key daily habits that you do each day that help you to scale your business okay uh well i think that i'd say so what i do is i don't work weekends as much as possible so i when i started i did a lot of out of hours work so I try to stick two hours um, as much as I can. And that's because I've recognized it's the long game, not the, not the sprint, it's the marathon. Yes. So even though in, in your own business, you feel you can never rest, I still feel like that. However, I've learned to stop and, and just regroup and have a life and friends and, and you know, do take on other commitments and that sort of thing. So that's a really important thing. I've had to learn to rest. I am by nature a person who never stops um, working. And uh, it's really been important to bring that in. I also work in sort of cycles. Um, so I haven't, uh, you know, from the um, Thought Leader Business School where we worked on a 90 day sort of cycle, we would launch some an idea and um, do it for 90 days and then reassess it I have continued to follow that cycle so every 90 days I have a company retreat um, on my own well I had it with Audrey until recently she's now <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes yeah, so I have a little uh, I, I celebrate everything that I have achieved and everything that she achieved while she was working with me um, and I 
then sort of look at the lessons that I've learned. So what have I learned from that period of time? And then I look at what I want to achieve in the next 90 days. And that is a really important rhythm in my business and makes a huge difference. I sometimes take a little break just after that or a sort of a, a delivery free break, which means either that I actually have a, a holiday depending on the time of year or I will um, focus a lot on sales for that two weeks. So I'll just take a time off from delivering my programs for just a week or two to, to sort of reset my energy levels and that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing that was, you know, I think is, has transformed my life is, uh, well, I asked Audrey and now I have a new assistant to um, schedule everything. So when I have a sort of, um, my mind is clogged with ideas of what I have to do, I make a list and send them to her and say, you know, I need time, two hours to do this and one hour to do that. And, and she then fills my schedule up and I, I it's very, very, um, it allows me a great deal of breathing space to know that it's been taken care of. Great. The excellent, excellent, excellent advice. The, the next section is the give section. So what's a cause that you're passionate about and why? I am on the brink of launching, it's called Indie Authors Australia, Independent Authors Australia. And the idea here is, there's a sort of self-publishing revolution going on in Australia. There's not only a lot of people are actually taking to, to self-publishing. The traditional publishers have no, uh, you know, are, are also interested in this area. They used to sort of decide that if anybody published for themselves, they were kind of dead to them. Um, they're quite interested in looking and, and watching what people in the self-publishing industry are doing. There are people who work in both sides. They self-publish books. They publish books with traditional authors. There's a whole range of services, um, digital printing, on, you know, uh, online um, resources. There are editors. There are people like me. So there's a huge um, ecosystem building up around self-publishing in Australia that I think is kind of really exciting. And I want to form an industry association that becomes a kind of hub point for this for this um self self-publishing revolution great great that sounds uh, very exciting and uh, by the time this podcast goes live i think some of the resources um hopefully you've you've launched it and it, it's available for people if not we'll we'll like uh, give listeners another way of finding out about you and getting on that wait list because uh, i'm sure there's lots of people here thoughts experts like you and i that are, are, are dying to uh, to get a book to the to the market and need that sort of support so i think it's a great idea and we'll uh, certainly make it easy for people to find you the last section is the action section we just give some quick fire responses to a couple of key questions to add some last last part or a lasting value for some of the blg audience so the first question is what's your number one personal productivity tip love this question and my personal productivity tip is the sacred pause <laughs> it's it's a you know so it's stopping so i use um pomodoro or focus keeper or whatever it's called now to uh to stop i think stopping every 25 minutes for five minutes or stopping every 20 minutes for two minutes whatever your preference mm. is um really is a huge productivity benefit you wouldn't think so it's counterintuitive what i find it does is shifting my focus for just those couple of minutes helps to re-energize me uh, it also means that if i've started to drift off into a kind of non-productive area I, I find myself if i find myself you know surfing the net or watching um cat videos I, not that i do but you know yes. um, then i not it kind of brings my attention to that to that drift and i find that uh working in a in a way where i'm pausing um it's around every 20 to 25 minutes is a huge productivity tip and also some sometimes if you've got a very large task you know uh writing a book for example um you might might want to do a chapter doing a chapter doesn't seem like much doing um eight or 12 product uh, little pomodoro sessions 
it, it's a feeling of accomplishment and as the wonderful uh, motivational um, expert Jason Fox talks about, it's a matter of you know, sort of celebrating the progress on the way to a goal and that's, that's a great way to do it. Favourite apps either on your iPhone or, sorry, phone? Um, you might have an Android, but uh, <laughs> either on your phone or on your desktop? No way. No, I'm definitely iPhone and, and Mac. Uh, <laughs> Pomodoro, as I said, it's now called Focus Keeper. The other one that's kind of probably revolutionised my life and made my, my programs possible is Rev.com, which is a recording app that you can link to transcribers and they transcribe usually fairly accurately, you know, a very good job. Uh, and very, very amazingly priced and very fast. So fantastic service um, uh, really has... Uh, transcribing was the only part of journalism I absolutely hated. Uh, it's backbreaking. Um, I have a little app called Buddhify. So if you, if you want to think about sort of keeping your... One of the, the challenges we have as, a, as a, a person in their own business is to keep ourselves, our minds focused and, and rested and energised and all the complexities of it. So Buddhify is a little, um, it's a, a Buddhist meditation app. So it just gives you tiny little, you know, three, five minute, you can have a, a Buddhify meditation to go to sleep, to wake up, to what, to even be online. <laughs> <laughs> to go for a walk that's great so you can integrate your uh, meditation into your day and the other one I love is swipe which allows you to sort of uh, write to write text using a sort of uh, a, you know, without ever taking your finger off the keyboard you just run it around and it picks out the words that you want oh. I don't know how to explain it properly it's a no. typing right. app uh, right. that well, you, that you find. well we'll definitely uh that and all the other uh, um links that you've mentioned we'll definitely put in the in the show notes and i know this question uh sometimes is very easy to ask but for someone like yourself i'm assuming it's going to be a hard question so i'll i'll, uh, I'll put it out there and you can reframe it but uh a favorite book and why okay okay that is that is that is big <laughs> yes. um i'm going to say True Refuge by Tara Brach. Uh, Tara Brach is a, is a Buddhist meditation teacher. You can tell that I've got this kind of aspect going on in my life. I think it's really important because, you know, it's pretty challenging um, to try to do, to achieve these goals. And she is very good at helping me to recognise that I don't have to be perfect at everything. And to recognise that, you know, I, I, um, I can be very good without having to be perfect. So uh, she's great. And it's a fantastic story about how to really um, come home to yourself and feel really happy in yourself for whatever's going on at the moment. And it really has made a big difference. And that's one of the things is that, I, you know, my, my ultimate goal really is to love what I do every day and the people that I work with. And some parting advice. What's some parting advice that you have for the BLG audience? I'll listen to all the advice that everyone gives you. <laughs> um, I think the advice is um, that the answers are always simpler than you think. So I, I think the, the, the advice is don't overcomplicate your offer. You know much more than you think you know. Um, and you need to make it simple for, um, uh, for people to understand so yeah keep it simple don't complicate it start start with something that seems unbelievably simple to you and go from there brilliant well uh, it's been fantastic listening to your story kath i think you know you were a, a, an astute observer of some very famous people as you said through your brw days but what i'm really excited about is now that you're starting to actually make your mark on the world and i think you know indies Authors Australia is going to be hugely successful. So uh, we'll have the, the links in the show notes for that. But uh, well done for taking the brave step, seeing that the industry you were in was uh, changing, but now you found another way to be in the industry, do something you'd love, but actually help a lot of other people. So uh, well done for that. And, uh, and just on that, how can people find out more about you to help uh, support you in, in your support of them? 
Yeah. Look, I mean, I'd love to connect up with people on LinkedIn through um, the Build, Build Live, Give uh, community. Um, they can find me at my website, kathwalters.com.au. That's Kath with a K. Um, and also, you know, I'd love, I'd love it if people would like to sign up for my free weekly blog there because, um, hey, everything I know is actually in those blogs. So <laughs> you can have it all for free. <laughs> You'd be crazy not to. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, it was brilliant having you on, Kath. I've, you know, known you for quite some time. And I've just seen you continuing uh, to grow and uh, yeah, I wish yeah, you all cool. the best with uh, the next phase and uh, well done. Fantastic. Good. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Paul. And, and same to you. It's just been great to see all your evolutions. Brilliant. Great. Thanks, Kath. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Build Live Give Show. If you found this show helpful, please share it with others so we can build businesses, live great lives and give back to the community. If you would like to join the BLG community, go to our website, www.buildlivegive.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.